Earthlings. Hello. Hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. Look, look who we can't get rid of, folks. Look who we can't. He's, he's back. He's Hi. back. How do we do the diagonal? Oh, wrong one. Oh, wow. Diagonal's oh. really hard. I can't do it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's not right. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's no. no. Oh, I've got to do that. Oh, yeah, that is tough. <laughs> Trying to do diagonal, that's really difficult. <laughs> Hello, right, so welcome along to the Animal Rights Show, people. Uh, we've got, as they say, the two runnies, a packed, a packed show we've got. Um, really in the sense that we're going to go through some of the kind of news items uh we're really going to start off as we should with uh with the situation with mel broughton um and so uh let me bring up the uh the thing on that so for people who don't know uh, mel um was uh, attacked yet again um by a hunt and uh and we do believe he's, he's out of hospital again, but he's got two broken ribs again. And um, how many did he have the first time, Wendy? Because he had a pun punctured lung and then some ribs, right? Well, he had a suspected punctured lung. I'm not sure if it actually was in the end, but he had, um, yeah, he had a couple of broken ribs and a broken collarbone last time as well. But yeah, it, did, it was very close to puncturing his lung last time, I believe. Yeah. Okay, well, um, a bit of a big, a bit of a trigger warning, I suppose, on the first picture, which is uh, of uh, <clears throat> Mel when he's unconscious. So, th this this is um, from Saturday morning, and in fact, uh, Mel was going to be a guest on the uh, the Global Veg Fest um, platform on the Sunday, but he couldn't he couldn't make that. But the latest news is um, that I think he's out now. He's, he's probably discharged himself. You know what Mel's like. So, uh, if you if you're watching this, Mel, we're um, wishing you well. So this is um, a picture of uh, when the ambulance people arrived. So, <clears throat> so again, they were they were obviously taking it very serious, and it still looks like, uh, you know, Mel is still in a bit of a state at, at this stage. I think so. I think he was struggling to breathe, and the and the hunts people were finding that highly amusing. Apparently, mm. so. Yeah, well, it was nice. Uh, and so this is a bit of a conglomeration. So the guy bottom left, he's the, the guy who is the scum that attacked him, apparently. And then the, the middle picture, if you, as it were, um, look at the ponies at the top, then the, the middle picture, that, that's him again attacking somebody else, apparently. <clears throat> the, the top left is somebody being hit by the, the tailgate of, um, of one of the horse boxes. And then the um, the bottom picture on the right is the the hunt casting the hounds. Now, Ronnie, um, this this is supposed to be illegal, isn't it? Now in in Britain, uh, uh, well, it's it, um, it's lawful for them to, to pursue a trial. You see, and this is the problem because it, it's very easy for them to ignore that. I mean, who's who's going to police them? And also, e even if they do uh, pursue a trial, um, um, then you know. Free, free living beings, you know, foxes and and, and, and and other animals, deer, are still at risk because if they, they come across the scent of one of those animals, they're, they're going to chase that animal instead. So so to have those hounds running around in, in, in the countryside in a pack in any way it, it is, it is a risk to other animals. And, and really the, the legislation should have been formulated as such that the hunts would have had to disband trail hunting should not have been allowed because it is still other animals are still at risk and the other thing of course is they're still killing the dogs they kill thousands of their mm. hounds every year they always have done ones that aren't suitable for hunting in the first place and ones that are are, 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 are too old to hunt and that that really can be at like maybe six years old so really quite quite young for a dog and and these are all killed you never hear of you know how many people have heard of the you know, somebody having, um, uh, you know, taking care of a, a fox sound. I've, I've known one person who did. Um, that's about all. You know, the, these dogs are all killed, and this, that's still happening now, exactly the same as it happened um, when 
be, before the before the hunting act but the other thing i'd really like to say on this is this this is another yet more evidence for what i've been saying for a long time that that hunt subs should not be going out in the field without self-defense training then and basically they're going like lambs to the slaughter there's all these people that that don't have a clue how to defend themselves against some really nasty characters and so what happened to Merle is going to happen again and again and again and I think it's far better to have smaller groups of sabs that are well well trained in self-defense that have gone through a course in karate or whatever you know self-defense training have smaller groups of sabs going out who know what they're doing who can defend themselves rather than lots of people who are just like you know are, are, are just really potential victims and I think the hunt subs really need to kind of crack down on this and have a rethink of how they operate a little ninja team a team of like sad yeah. ninjas yeah because it would be much more effective because because my, my, my experience of when, when I went hunt sub, now, now you know I'm at fault as well you know our, our hunt sub group didn't didn't train people in self-defense and and we were very lucky I mean we did used to band together and defend each other uh, and and we were called violent for that just because we defended ourselves and didn't just allow the hunt to, to attack us, you know. Um, but nevertheless, we weren't trained and we should have been. But the ethos of it, you know, didn't guide us in that direction. You know, the ethos of hunt sab should be you, you train in self-defense. You know, you, you're against some really violent people that see, that see in a sense, non-violence as a sign of weakness. Because you know that you know what are they doing? You know that they're 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 attacking um, animals um, that can't defend themselves, aren't they? So so these people are basically bullies and cowards. So if they see people that can't defend themselves, and it doesn't really surprise me that they they picked on Mel. He's an older guy, you know. He's he's not like your your sort of conventional tough guy, is he? So they're going to you know pick on people like that. These these people are cowards and bullies, and so. Um, I think it would be far better to have small groups of well-trained SABs uh, because the other thing is you get a it's not just training in self-defense, it's training on in how to operate against the hunt because quite often sometimes we would go out in, you know, in, in, like for instance on a joint hit where, the, um, where there were lots of SABs um, from all over the place went there and some of them actually did more harm than good. Some of them were, were, were driving the, the, the fox back into the hounds because they didn't know what they're doing. You see, so, you know, you need to have small groups of people that are well-trained in how to sabotage hunt and well-trained in self-defence. And, and the hunts have to be far, far more effective, I think, if they did that. Are you uh, nominating yourself, General, for training well, <laughs> for training the SABs? <laughs> well, uh, if, if I was probably about 20 or 30 years younger, yes, uh, yeah, yes. I mean, I, you know, if, if, if I was back in my younger days again and I was going sabbing, I would, well, well, even if I wasn't going sabbing, I would train in self-defense because I think it's really important, you know, these days that people have that training. There's a lot of very nasty, violent people about, mm. you know, that it can happen. It doesn't necessarily happen on, on, on a hunt set. You know, there's been people attacked on demonstrations as well. And, you know, I, I, mm. I think that anyone that's going to go into this potential risky situation like that um, should get trained in self-defense. You know, just well, this came up actually. Well, in... if, if you were 10 or 20 years younger, you'd still be old. So, um... I, I, would still, yeah, I would still be old, yeah. yeah, yeah no, oh, absolutely, yeah. But it's, let's say 50 years younger or 60 years younger, maybe. You know, yeah. So, if I going, back to, yeah. going back to the proposition of, um, of SABs, you know, say martial arts, that kind of stuff. The real problem with that is that, I mean, I believe that Mel was um, attacked when he was climbing a gate or crossing a, a gate and and that and that's where where they do it and um you know or they'll use vehicles i mean i've i've known um i've known hunters kind of just steer their horse into motorbikes and that kind of stuff and so um i mean you're you're right they, they are very violent and they don't care but i mean mm. they'll they'll find a way even against but, people with training wouldn't they but what well, you see they'd be wary of people you see they know that hunts up to that most types of pushover they know that these people aren't going to fight back and so that they can attack them in the same way as they attack the animals uh, they pursue without any comeback. If they knew that these people were well trained in martial arts, they'd be very wary about attacking anyone in any way, in case, you know, for fear of what happened to them. I remember once in our hunt subgroup in North London, there was an occasion where um, some hunt thugs, you know, roughed up the sabs and threw them in nettles and all that. 
So the next week we went out, we got some lads from a karate club who were, I mean, they weren't savage, but they were anti-hunt and they came with us. And as soon as the hunt thugs kind of descended on our vehicles, these guys got out and did all the karate and all the hunt thugs ran away, all ran up the hill in terror. And so if hunt slabs were trained like that, then these people wouldn't wouldn't think um, that the slabs would push over and, and would be very wary about, about doing anything violent. Although sometimes you get the opposite, don't you? And actually, Dave's just, yeah, Dave said contact Hench Herber, Herbivore. He used to be a head doorman. But you do get, like, when you see people um, who work at clubs on the door, the door people who work there, you get people because the, the door people are kind of big, tough, strong, or, or they're alleged to be, you get people wanting to come up and, like, prove themselves against those people, don't you? You get, uh, they, you get that sense of, oh, I'm, I'm going to prove myself. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, prove yeah. myself. And, They're usually yeah. fueled by alcohol at that stage, though, I think. So it would be a bit different at yeah. 9 o'clock in the morning on a, on a hunt, I would think. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is a thing that some people would see it as a challenge. It's a challenge, uh, certainly. Yeah. Possibly, but I think, I, you know, I, I think overwhelmingly they would be wary. You, you know, you're dealing mm -hmm. with people that bullies and cowards, why are they pursuing these, you know, these, these small animals in the first place? You know, you know th these, these are people that have kind of got that. Men mental psychosis or whatever and, and mm. so you they wouldn't be doing that if if those animals could turn around and give them a good hiding you know and so i think that we have to be aware of that mentality and and act accordingly really i, I really assume the, uh, the attack was not uh recorded there is no footage of the actual attack uh well for investigation reasons for investigation mm. reasons no, if you look there, Mel, Mel has got a camera there, see? Yeah. Yes. Well, last, last time he was attacked, they uh, they they took all uh, everyone's cameras from them when he got attacked by the person on the horse's back. Yeah, uh, they took all the cameras, so they, they took all the footage. So I don't know what's happened this time with, with the footage, but. Well, ironically, we're going to we're going to be showing some drone drone footage. I mean, it would be a good idea to have a drone in the air to, to film all this kind of stuff. I mean, like, um, I used to drive people to distraction in the 80s because I used to say that the SABs ought to have micro lights. It, it, that, it, th those were the things in those days. And I was based in Essex at the time, and there was five hunts in Essex. And so a micro light could have kind of almost like monitored all of them in, in, in a way. So I, I always thought that would have been a good idea. But with these, with these drones, which can take footage, then there's no, uh, you know, as long as they don't know who's controlling it and where from, then they're not going to be able to take their cameras, are they? So it must be one, mm -hmm. one strategy, I would think. The, the, Mel, was, Mel, Mel was very keen. Mel, I just want to say that Mel, Mel was really keen, keen to point out that he's not the only one who was attacked, that actually, even at that hunt, there were several uh, violent attacks. He just ended up, like, with quite, you know, bad injuries, but there were several violent attacks. And well, that, that's, said, that, that, one, which is like that picture there, that's somebody right? else, isn't it? That's somebody else there. Yeah, there were at least three or four incidents at that just at that very same hunt as well, people getting um, attacked. The other thing yeah. I'd like to say is, is look, you know, um, basically, hunt, hunt, uh, the hunt is a hierarchical structure. You know, the joint masters are in charge of the hunt. They can say who's allowed to take part in this one. So I think, to a large extent, the answer to this is put pressure on those people. Put pressure to, on, on the joint masters. You know, they, they, they won't be part of this, but... but that they will have kind of allowed this to happen, that they will have kind of, you know, um, and pressure needs to be put on those people to, to not allow the, these, these, these guys back on the hunt. And, and so you need to go right to the top where pressure is going to be exerted on the people that run and control the hunt and say, look, mate, we're going to make your life a misery until you stop this. Because these people are solicitors and they're big people like that that don't want trouble, don't want aggro. And so put pressure on them and you know to get them to control these 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 thugs so they're not allowed to if they attack any hunt subs they're not allowed to go out and hunt again mm. yeah and what's interesting with this um sorry roger go ahead well i was just gonna say we maybe should do a few hellos really um i'll say hello to philip uh philip <laughs> from new york this evening I want, to say hello to Bazaar, I want to say thank you to Philip for um, mentioning my speech as well when he was on the panel at, at Global Veg Fest. So thank you, Philip. It's nice to see you here. 
And who else should we say hello to? Are we not saying hello to everyone? We're just choosing random people. No, no, I think we should go, go from the top, I think, as, as, it, as it were. Let's go from the top. Oh, so we had Dave, who gets the first prize. Yeah. The first. And which is weird because it says 7.41 p.m. So was that yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> <laughs> they're, oh, we got... they're really taking it seriously now, aren't they? This I know, I know, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got Vegmet Cobod, who was, I think, actually might have been first tonight, today. <laughs> but we'll let you two fight that out. Um, we've got Amber, who says we can't stay, so, so they might not be here now. But hi, Amber. Hope you catch the recording. We've got Deb and Louisa. Dave, of course, we've got Philip, Bernie V, and Z uh, Zelia. Is that, have I pronounced that correctly, Zelia? Sorry if I didn't. And we've got Jennifer, vegan songstress. We've got Laura, vegan mooncat. Hey, vegan mooncat. And uh, we have, I think that is, is that everyone? Yeah, that's everyone. Mm. And sorry, you're, you're about to make a point there, Wendy, when I cut you off. Sorry about that. Oh, damn. And oh, Anna. Right. <laughs> We forget about to say hello to Joanna. Oh, Joanna, so sorry. Oh, Joanna. <laughs> Joanna's birthday, everyone, today, by the way. Happy birthday, Joanna. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for coming on on your birthday. Um, so, yeah, I was just going to say that at the moment, of course, they're doing what, what's called cubbing. They're training the next generation of, of hounds and blooding them to get them ready for, you know, training when the season starts to for the for the hunting season but what's also interesting with this not only they're training the next generation of hounds they're training the next generation of humans because if you can see in the picture here there's a, a quite a young person on the back of that horse which kind of leads us into the next uh slide perhaps roger it does which, i mean that that was only a few days after this wasn't it so yeah, so this is really sad because um, a two-year-old girl has died after falling from a pony at a Beedale hunt meet. So this was this was just yeah a few days a few days ago, which is obviously really tragic. Um, but yeah, so these events are actually training the next generation of hunters, hounds. You know, it's just I don't, I don't know. It's just really it's it's just like passing down the learning, isn't it, to everyone? But it, but how sad that now you know they're bringing children so young, and socialising them into this murder and an ab absolute you know bloodthirsty so-called sport at a young it's, age. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It, it's shocking. Yeah. It's shocking though because in general parents avoid violent uh, situations for their kids. I mean, even if they enjoy the. Uh, the hunting uh, themselves uh i cannot really imagine how to decide uh, to take a toddler with them i mean obviously uh you cannot control what the, the, the kid is going to see and uh, the images will probably be very violent so i, I was shocked to, to he hear that this was during a hunt well a couple of things to be said on that level in the sense that um most, I mean, the, that child would have been in the field, which is the riders who follow the, the hunt. And usually most of the people in the field don't see the kill. In fact, I've, I've known people who have been in the field, you know, been hunt, hunters for many years and they've never seen a kill. Because um, the hounds lead and the, the, hunt go, the hunt staff go with them, you know, the actual hunter and whippers in and all that. And then, and then the the field follows. And usually, by the time, usually by the time the field catches up with the hunt, then it's either all over or the fox has escaped. The only the only difference is sometimes if they if they will dig out the fox, then they will then they'll just throw them to a pack right in front of everybody, and so that that then would be a, an issue. And Wendy was saying about um, you know them kind of blooding the hounds and everything. I remember going to a pony meet. Um, in Essex, and uh, there's there's one little kid. He kept he kept riding up to the sabs, and we couldn't really work out what he was doing because he he was kind of it was kind of showing us his face, and it, and he was showing us the fact that he he himself had been blooded. So they you know they cut the the, the tail, the brush off the fox, dip, dip it in blood, and, and smear it on their face. And he was he was proud as punch, you know. So like you say, it's all to do with socialization into violence, you know. Yeah, shocking, isn't it? Mm. 
The um, somebody let me go back to final point on this perhaps is um, let me see if I can find it. It was a while ago. Dave, Dave's just making a point while you're looking mm. for that. Uh, we're just saying um, I was. I was on a sub, a terrier man got out of his Range Rover with a large woodman's axe. As he approached us, we began to stone him until he backed down, having lost several windows. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah, <excellent>. Shame. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we mustn't forget the other victims of hunting. That's the horses. You know, I mean, yes. we sat on the backs mm. of horses anyway. What's, what's going on there? But, you know, they, they you know, you know what happens when they're too old for the, the, you yeah, know, yeah. uh, and you know then there's all the you know at the beginning there's all the breaking in and you know the, the suffering and oppression that's caused by that so that's you know that there are several victims yeah, of yeah. Uh, there are several uh, you know different types of animal victims of of hunting yeah, yeah. Absolutely. so so zelia is saying that they're liars that the hunters going back to what you were saying uh ronnie about the the hounds being killed fairly early it's interesting because um, the hunts tend to have a contradictory set of claims. They first of all say that they can't be rehomed, and then they claim that they are rehomed. Uh, you know, when they retire, as it were. You know, they're not rehomed. That's nonsense. You know, when when do you see anyone walking a a foxhound? <laughs> you don't, do you? They just don't. You know, they're not. They're not. They're, they're not rehomed, and they're very difficult. Well, after they've been in in the pack of hounds for that number of years. It's very, very mm. difficult to acclimatise them to a to, to a home. You know, they mm. lived in kennels in, and 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 been in a pack. It's it, you know that's that's very you know very 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 hard. Um, and no, no, they they're killed. And and it, you know, there was an estimate some years ago that it was about five thousand a year are killed by the hunts. Whether that's quite as much as that now, I don't know. But it certainly, I would say, would be in the thousands. Mm. I'd I'd agree with that about foxhounds. What what do you reckon about beagles? I mean, you often see a lot of beagles about, but. Yeah. Whether they'd be hunting beagles, I think beagles might be a little bit easier. Well, a lot of beagles, be beagles are kind of, kind of bred to be, you know, you, you know, taken to people's homes, where, where it's like foxhounds aren't in a sense. So, so it, beagles, yeah, yeah, it kind of depends on, the, you know, if people have beagles as, as, as puppies, then obviously it's easier. Um, the, most of the beagles I know that, that people have adopted, people I know have adopted are ones where, say, the laboratory or breeding centre is closed, mm -hmm. breeding centre, and the RSPCA has mm -hmm. maybe got the beagles out and people have given uh, have given them homes. And that's, you know, that's where. Yeah, and some of them yeah. can be quite difficult if they're, if, if they're a few years old and have never been in a home. They can be difficult. But, they're, you know, they're generally kind of sorts sort of smaller dogs and foxhounds and maybe probably easier to, more easier to acclimatise to that. And while we're on the subject of beagles, this leads us beautifully in. <laughs> <laughs> to our next topic. See, people think we throw this show together. <laughs> Not true. Not true. <laughs> there is access <Yeah>. planning. <laughs> so, uh, oh, just, Dave uh, just asked a question. We used to use citronella to mask the fox scent. Anyone know if it works? I think, yeah, I think it does, yeah. they, still use, they still use uh, yeah, citronella. Yeah, it, it, it does work, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, Bob Martin must have made a fortune out of the Sabs. It was, um, yeah. Well, I, I was on, I was on a bus with another sab after we'd done a sab. We sat on this this bus, and there's a little boy with his mum behind us, and and he kept saying to his mum, "Mummy, mummy, that man in front's got dog bum stuff on him." Dog bum stuff. Dog bum stuff. That could be that could be read in several ways. That could run. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so we, we're gonna we're gonna play this uh, drone footage now. We need to say, don't we, Wendy? That um, so this is drone footage of um, Camp Beagle or the laboratory or the breeding centre uh, associated with Camp Beagle. And most people probably will have seen the pictures of the gate. And it's very misleading, isn't it, Wendy? Because this is what this yeah. compound here is what's behind yeah. that gate. It's amazing, really. So. And this is taken before the camp was set up, this drone footage. So it's, it looks a little bit different now outside the gates to this. Yeah. Footage, so. And I've got to mute myself um, for this. So give us a thumbs up if everything's okay. I'm just going to go right up to the edge. Yeah. So I'm just going to go through lots of nettles. And just to the right, 
There's a few brick buildings with pitched tile roofs. There's a little um, tiny forklift just in front of me. And then to the left is the dark grey building, like a hangar almost, a small hangar. And that's where the noise of the dogs is coming from. And you can tell they're puppies. Anyone who knows about dogs knows that's the sound of puppies. How do you feel when you hear it? Sick, sad. It makes me nearly, um, it makes my bottom lip go. It's, it's, uh, we're going straight into, into some primeval feelings. Uh, and at the end of the day, a lot of it is about our attachment to dogs. But I see the dogs as the ambassadors of all the other laboratory animals. And if we can, if we can make a stand about dogs, it's a start. So I'm Lisa and I live locally about 20 minutes away. Um, and I heard about this place just by chance on a Facebook post um, and came down, I think it was that very same day. I've been coming pretty much every day since. You've never been part of an animal rights protest before, have you? Why this one? I think for me, it was the right time and it was something I felt passionate about. So my children are getting much older and I now have my time to do things that I want to do. Dogs are a companion animal. And obviously I don't, I don't agree with any vivisection on any animals, but dogs and primates are the ones that really get my heart. And coming here and hearing yesterday particularly, yesterday was so difficult. There was, it sounded like hundreds of dogs barking and howling and yelping. You can't hear that kind of thing and then walk away. And it sounds silly, while we're here, I feel like we're protecting them. What's it like when the staff are going in and out or when you know that dogs are being brought in and out? Oh, so I've, there's twice um, dogs have been brought out. The first time the police had blocked the roads and that was when they, they brought, I don't know how many police. We got as far as the roundabout, they'd blocked everything. So you were trying to get to yeah. the protest? Yeah, it's your instinct, you just want to stop them. No, I had a couple of days off work after that. It, it completely destroyed me. I don't think it's something you ever forget, that sight and that noise. And you live locally, so do you get a sense of, you know, other members of the camp have told me there's loads of local support. I've heard from listeners to my show who say they don't really appreciate the disruption. What do you hear? I hear more support than not. Um, we've done an outreach in Huntingdon where there was more support than no support um standing down here one evening i think every car this is when we went to the home office every single vehicle that went past were like bearing the horns it was lovely to hear um we only have the odd local that goes past and shouts something not very favorable out the window or they do hand gestures but we have so much support so yeah and even from social media a lot of local people are in support of this place Camp Beagle protesters Lisa and John there. Hmm. See, it's interesting, isn't it, how John says, uh, so that was John Curtin, who's, um, uh, they, they've referred to him as a veteran <laughs> activist. He's, he's been around for a long time and he's... He's only, he's uh, you only know. a youngster, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> he's a whippersnapper. <laughs> he's a <only> whippersnapper. <laughs> he's a Mike whippersnapper. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and um, it's it's interesting how how John said that the dogs are ambassadors for other animals, so that it, it's almost like this protest is is gain, gaining so much public support, and from locals like Lisa as well. And there are a lot of locals there who didn't know this place existed until they saw it on social media or heard about it on the news and local media and things like that. And so they're coming down to support, they're sending food supplies. But of course, it is growing so much support because these uh, individuals in the facility are dogs. And so, um, and as, as Lisa said on, on that video, dogs are, dogs are kind of seen as companions and, and she was saying how um, dogs and primates really get to her heart. So I think this is the kind of theory behind this. Although obviously there's the activists want all um, animal research to be stopped, that this is a kind of strategy to build the, 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 the campaign and get people involved and get it into the media to get the attention because people are more emotionally connected to dogs because 
Of course, a lot of people will have dogs living with them in their families at home and that there's been that history of human and dog companionship and things like that. Um, but it's but it is interesting because it does raise that question. And, and actually, we've got a clip uh, coming up from Gary Francione, who was on a panel with Roger and and Philip, who's in the chat, and um, Tim Barford, who who was the host of of Global Veg Fest, who talks about how single issue campaigns like this are actually problematic because they're giving out the message that okay, we're saying, saying? that that dogs are the are more important. For example, you know, we're, we're not trying to stop. Um, research on rats or or mice or whoever so this is Brian coming along trying to turn my <laughs> computer around um, and, and that it's quite problematic because it's not an anti-species message and um, you know so it, it, it kind of raises that question of how do we get that balance between sending a clear anti-species message and also building a strong campaign with a lot of public support from people who are who are not vegan and who are not animal rights activists. Um, so it's really interesting. I don't know if, if we should play the clip first. What did you think? And let people react to that? Or do you want to say something first? Well, I think I think this is um this is obviously true. And I think that in that sense, going going after the, the dogs um is almost like being suggested by John as, as a kind of tactic there, because when 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 we first heard about it, which was like six or seven weeks ago. We saw the initial press, if you remember, and there, and there was talk about them using ferrets and pigs and all the rest of it. And then it turned out uh, Mel Mel told us that uh, in 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 Camp Beagle, that's all they have is, is is the dogs. And so there is that kind of issue they are going after mm -hmm. what you might call the low hanging fruit in a speciesist world. But that kind of basically means then that um, if Camp Beagle gets closed down. Nobody, nobody gets saved in a way, but, but it does mean that they move on to to, to who, whoever else would replace the beagles. And I think that's what kind of John was kind of suggesting that um, it, it's a it's a way into a long campaign where you might have to virtually go species by species, I suppose. And then you know, then you've got the issue that uh, most most of those who are viviceptors are, are mice. And so mm. they'll they'll have the least, you know, uh, likelihood of public support. So I mean, it's yeah. obviously going to be a long kind of, you know, if you're going to go species by species and country by country, then you're talking about many many years, uh, I would think. Mm. It's it's also whether mm. the state will allow you to do that. Of course, you, you look at the um, go back to something that where I think there's a lot of similarities in the sense. Mm -hmm. The campaign to get to close the shack campaign to close hunted in life sciences and those same same people have successfully run campaigns to close uh, breeding centers the bird animal breeding centers before that and, and of course you know when these things start gathering um momentum it looks like there's going to be some kind of domino effect and that's where the state stops as it will, it will step in and bring strong measures to stop it because of course you know, their they're supporters, certainly, you know, with the present type of government they've got, their supporters of that type of industry, they're not going to allow that to happen. They're not going to allow these places to be continually rolled over, you know, as much as we would like to see that happen. In reality, it's, it, it's kind of not. I mean, already we've, we've got the situation where, you know, beagles are being taken out of that place, um, you know, with, with heavy police presence, you know, the, the, the protests haven't been able to stop the beagles being taken out. And of course, even if they did stop the beagles being taken out of that place, while demand demand continues for beagles for experiments, those beagles would just be supplied from other places. That same company's got other places. You know, where so they, you're just moving the problem they, around, really. You're moving, around. moving the problem around, is, changing the, problem. the species. This is a problem where you attack su supply instead of attacking demand. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Camp Beagle is is a bad thing. I think there's many positive aspects of it. I mean, I kind of won't mm. go on about it now, <laughs> but I think that it's not that it can be turned to positive advantage. That that's that that's my feeling, and can be used in, yeah, in fact yeah. as a, as an attack on um, demand rather than just supply. How, how many how many of these Roger Yates are there suddenly? Um... I know. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's like your brother. Too many. It, it looks just like me, that guy. Isn't he? Um, <laughs> so we we we're going to show. It's only it's a two minute clip, and then we've got a one minute clip, I think. 
um, just to, to kind of like al almost like see what you know the kind of fancy own kind of version of what Ronnie was saying just now in a sense but let's uh, oh I've got to hang on a minute I've got to mute myself again otherwise I'm gonna mess the sound up I started. So it was, it was a very uh, uh, energized anti vivisection movement, and it was basically composed of people who were eating animals. You know, they'd go to the anti vivisection you know demonstration, and they would go out and they would eat animals. And so, there's a sense in which these these campaigns, like all single issue campaigns, I think you know, as 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 you know, it's no secret that I despise the single issue campaigns. I think there's the death of a of a coherent radical social movement and um and i think that that um uh, what what you see when you're talking about you know the the anti-vivisection movement is victories which are they may they may serve some purpose and roger's dead right on this and he's a sociologist and he's you know and I, I i defer to him on this he he's saying this may serve a, a social movement purpose it may it may help people to get excited and to become involved I don't think it's gonna do a damn bit. I don't think it's gonna do anything. I mean, I really don't. And I mean, I think in the end, it does nothing. They're gonna get the beagles from somewhere else if they close this this place down. They'll get. I mean, this has been going on forever. I mean, and and we're using more animals now. You know, for a period of time, in the 1970s, the number of animals being used in experiments went down. It's now through the roof. And and you know, th the pressures are going to continue to use animals in experiments for all sorts of purposes um the arguments will be made that it's necessary as i say i think these arguments are problematic i think but i, I certainly think they're more complicated than the arguments for using animals in the numerically more significant context of eating them um but but so what you shut down one place and they get them from someplace else and you know you stop using dogs because we fetishize dogs and they'll start using you know people don't fetishize rodents the way they fetishize dogs or cats so the fact that you know they they may say look you know we're going to stop using we're going to stop using dogs is that a victory it will be declared to be a victory and that is in my judgment problematic I think we're unique because now, as you can see, we are in a studio atmosphere. We're oh, <laughs> that was an unexpected one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> New York Jets. What's this one about, Roger? So this is. Yeah. Are we going straight into the second one? Yeah. So just while that one lines up, it is. It's interesting, isn't it? And I can yes. see. Sorry about that, folks. I uh, pushed the wrong button. Um, oh, that's all right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there was, there, I think there was two issues there. I mean, what, one, with what Ronnie was saying about them, they'll, they'll, they'll replace them. But, but previously, the, the one that um, Garofancion referred to was I was making a, a social movement point, which is kind of really what Ronnie ended with at, at the end of, of what he just said, in the sense that, it, you know, it's kind of galv galvanized some some action it's it's brought vivisection back into the movement and so you've got to understand i suppose with these kind of things that there are pros and cons i mean i suppose we've got to understand that there's those two sides of the same coin and then it's a question of of whether we're we're, we're prepared to uh you know to, to pay that price if you like i'm going to mute myself again and try and set up the other the other bit while you while you lot took <laughs> Well, just building on that, Roger, actually, what Roger was just saying about the social um, aspect and the galvanising, it's it's also very different, like if, because I know um, Gary Francione very much advocates for putting all of our resources and all of our energy into um, vegan education, because that's the way to change the species' paradigm, and that's obviously at the root of all of everything that we're fighting against. But there's something very different as an activist as well, like when you're doing something like um, when you're at Camp Beagle, you're at the protest, you're you're with the other activists, when you're there, it's such a visceral um, thing because you can you can hear the dogs, you can actually hear them. And like where that drone showed you the the sort of behind the gates and everything, if you have to kind of go through the woods and through barbed wire and everything, but you can get to the side of the units and you can hear the dogs and it's so real. And then you've got people bringing their um, kind of companion beagles outside the front of the gates 
and there was some video in the in the group the other day and there's a puppy beagle of a very similar age to the puppies that will be taken out and into the laboratories and you only have to look at these be with these individuals and just you just get that emotional reaction and, and you can get that sense of the reality of what you're what you're doing and who you're fighting for and you get that real sense of allyship as well and that strong sense of purpose of what you're doing which is very different to when you're standing in the street doing vegan outreach and you know you might be sowing seeds but you don't know if that person is leaving you and they're going to go vegan like overnight or in a month 10 years or never you don't know you don't get that same kind of um, purpose in the same way and I think both are really important I obviously think vegan education is really absolutely essential to change the paradigm and that strong anti-speciesist anti-oppression message is fundamental but I do feel like protests like this are really important to keep the issues like this in the light and also to be a dissenting voice to what is going on because it's it's highlighting what's going on but also it's showing that not everyone in society finds this acceptable we have to show that we there is opposition to this i feel it's important to to open people's eyes and get them thinking and i think camp, camp beagle has created activists and it has changed changed activists into vegans as well there are people coming down who wouldn't have even thought or been open to veganism who have been um jumped on board with this uh, with this campaign and then being around the animal rights activists and the vegans and now seeing things in a very different way once the attitude is, is shifted they're more open to hearing about veganism which they probably wouldn't have been before so there's a different way in sometimes i, I agree completely with you wendy and i, I was thinking that uh, uh, with protests uh, our uh, arguments become visible in a different completely different way a whole community is involved maybe media uh, are involved uh, even if uh, a campaign fails, um, it, it still is a, pro a protest again uh, against vivisection. So I, I think that in a way it helps uh, um, to create a conversation around the, the issue of, vivi of vivisection and to make people that have never think about it uh, think where they stand on it. Mm. Oh, I've got, I've got, I think we've got, to, we've, we've got to look at how are we going to actually add, end animal experimentation. We're going to add, end animal experimentation when we get legislation in Parliament banning it. That's the only way it's going to really totally end. It can be reduced through, through various things. It can be reduced through, say, people boycotting charities that fund animal experimentation by people supporting other charities that fund non-animal methods of research um, by putting pressure on animal experimenters so they switch to... Um, non-animal methods, all these things to reduce it. Um, and I think Camp Beagle can lead to, to, to that. I, I, I think the whole, the, the whole kind of publicity surrounding Camp Beagle may already be putting pressure on the industry as a whole. Um, and, and that may result in the reduction of, of, of in animal experiments. Um, it, although it's true that, that if they close that, close the camp, it probably sort of makes the beagles will go from somewhere else. But I think the, 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 the overall effect of that kind of concern and that kind of pressure may, may have an effect on the industry of reducing experiments. But you see, the things, if we want, if we want legislation, we want laws to, um, to end uh, animal experiments, right? That means we've, we've got to have a government that's willing to end animal experiments. And that means that the people that, that are members of parliament have to think that way. And who are going to vote those people in? We have to have an electorate that's willing to vote those people in. And in order to have an electorate that's willing to vote those people in, we have to educate ordinary people to um, be opposed to speciesism, you know, to, to believe in animal, animal mm -hmm. liberation. How do you do that? You, you do that really by educating people to go vegan. So at the end of the day, if we really want to end animal experimentation and have it banned, vegan education is a fundamental thing we have to do. But I do think that the camp can lead to an increase in vegan education. It creates more, more activists. Um, I, I think that um, one of the important things that, that the camp needs to do, and I think the, the campaign, the campaign's already doing it, is they're holding, uh, um, they're holding stalls. Um, I think the woman on the earlier video mentioned it. They're holding mm. stalls in other places, right? Well, you see, if those stalls include, I think those stalls should include two elements. First of all, they should include what people themselves can do about animal experiments. In other words, that people should be given information about how you can boycott charities that, that fund animal experiments, how you can uh, help organisations 
that are funding non-animal methods. And also, they should be given information um, about going vegan at the same time. You see, and that's the way that, that that's the way that that can kind of, you know, the camp and the campaign can expand into something that that kind of tackles the issue at a more fundamental level. Well, that that leads yeah, I, I really. Yeah, that leads oh, to sorry, can I, <clears throat> can I just say something? Can I just come back with, to Ronnie on that uh, just for mm. a second? Sorry, Roger. Um, and I completely agree with what Ronnie just said as well, that education is essential, fundamental. And I also feel it works the other way around, that at vegan education, at vegan outreach, at vegan stores, it's important that we don't neglect the other ways that the other animals are used in our vegan advocacy because that because sometimes veganism is reduced so much that it almost becomes a single issue in itself in that we're advocating just for the focus on consumption and reducing it to a diet and and that message that this is this is what veganism is so i think it's important both ways around that vegan education ought to be also um making it clear in that the other ways other animals are used and that that it all needs to be stopped as you said as a clear anti species message so Yes, indeed. So the um, the clip we're about to show is um, it's about the abolitionization of single issues because um, needs to be if if most people kind of um, stipulate what Gary Francione's position on single issues is is it is unequivocally opposed to them. But actually, he's opposed to them in a, in a more nuanced way, which which is that he thinks theoretically they can be abolitionized, but it it won't work because <coughs> well effectively people mess it up and uh, if, if he was running one it would work but if anybody else is running one it, it kind of wouldn't so this is uh, <coughs> this is kind of teased out on this little bit here in sexism and misogyny it is vile phil just take a look at the imagery that has emerged over the past 60 70 years around fur it is appalling and i think that um you know, I don't regard that. What, what the argument you just made is let's look for incremental change if it's got a, a, a meaning. And the, the thing is, that's that's what I hear when people say, well, what about civil rights um, that had incremental change? Don't you support that? And the answer is civil rights involves a situation where you've got persons. And the issue is, are the persons being treated fairly? And then there's a debate about whether or not the persons are being treated fairly. And there will be different arguments being made. And, you know, those of us on the left will take one position. Those of us on the right will take another position. And, and but we're talking about persons and the treatment of persons. The problem that the problem why the incremental approach doesn't work when we're talking about animals is we're talking about things. And you're not going to change the status of animals as things which exist completely outside the moral and legal community. You're not going to change that by doing something like getting Saks Fifth Avenue to stop selling fur. This is, in my judgment, a great distraction. Take that energy. I'm sorry, I'll go back to something I said in 1984 at a big meeting that we had in Washington, D.C. about whether animal advocates should support the Animal Welfare Act amendments, which affect, you know, which which pertain to vivisection. And I said then, I believe then, I believe even more strongly now that we need to put all of our energy, all of our energy in, and all of our resources into veganism because that's the only thing that's going to shift the paradigm. Nothing else will shift the paradigm. These things, these fur things are, are in my judgment, are distractions and they're dangerous distractions because to the extent that anybody regards them as a victory, I think we've. I think. I think the movement is lost. Uh, obviously, we have different views on this. We should get together at the Greyhound Cafe next week and talk about. It. <laughs> I wonder if Philip is going to get together next week at the at the cafe. Well, I'm do not, do I'm let not, us know, I'm Philip. Not that was the the piece that we should have been playing, but it was it was the right time. It's just it didn't seem. To, it didn't no, seem I think it was. Right. It just. I, th I think the difficulty was... is that, that, that it's all very well uh, Gary saying that and you know that there is some sort of sense in in, in what he's saying but everyone campaigned for veganism but the reality is that's not going to happen the reality is you're going to get people that are attracted to single because there's a thing about that there's a kind of immediatism that people are attracted to see, see when you're campaigning for veganism you're you're you're, you're it's like a strategy of of kind of it's kind of long-term strategy to create fundamental change that's kind of you know a, a long a long-term thing and you don't you don't see you don't often see the results you don't often know who you 
who you turn vegan and, 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 and stuff like that. Um, and and a, a lot of people find that find that difficult. They attra- they get attracted to kind of more immediate things. So there's beagles in that place, isn't it terrible? Let's go there. It's like this immediate thing, you know. That and people, there's a place selling furs. Let's go outside. There's a animal's been taken to a slaughterhouse. Let's go outside there. Let's save movement. You know, people. Sorry, this is such a deep, deeply something deep in people's psychology. Kind of, I'm not like that. You know, I'm ha- I, you know, I. You know, I want to just do vegan outreach all the time because I see that really as the most fundamentally important thing. But I, I accept other people aren't like me, and, and so rather than kind mm-hmm. of battering really against a brick wall, trying to get these people to do something different, let's say let's say to them, look, you know, let's look at what you're doing and see how that can be maybe changed a little bit, improved a little bit, or move forward a, a, a bit, so that you know you're also educating people to go vegan. Doing. It's not like I kind of suggested mm-hmm. earlier about when people do the stalls, have some vegan information, you know, stuff like that, rather than kind of trying to, you know, persuade people to do something that in reality they're, they're not going to do. A lot of people are still going to carry on some belief and we have to accept that and, and see what we can do about it. Yeah, and also well, in, the, think... in the same. Go ahead, go ahead. It's really quick, oh, okay. Nella. Yeah, yeah. It's really quick. I was just going to say, in the same way that you said um, activists are drawn to like different things, like some are single issue, some will be more drawn to long term education. It's the same for the public as well, isn't it? Who we're speaking to, it's the same thing. Some people will be uh, really drawn to listening about a campaign that that involves beagles. Some people will be like, "Oh, I've been interested in veganism. Let me go and see what are they showing on this com- on this laptop in the middle of the street." Some people are drawn to that. So everyone's drawn to different things, whether it on you know our side or the other side of the of the conversation, really. So yeah, I was just going to say that. So Nella, go ahead. Oh, uh, I, got, I just want to say that in most cases, you can frame uh, a single issue campaign in an abolitionist way. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that if uh, most of the people protesting are vegan, I mean, they are here for a, a few hours with non-vegans, if uh, non-vegans appear at the protests. And uh, this is turned into an outreach event in most cases. I mean, there are people giving vegan literature. Um, they don't talk specifically only about the campaign. I mean, they use this as an opportunity. And I think this is a very positive thing because you combine two different kinds of activism in one event. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I think this does bring up a, an interesting issue because you 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 were saying about um, you know the non-vegans rubbing shoulders with the vegans thing, which is obviously a really good way you can imagine of people becoming uh, vegan activists, and it, it happened during the sabbing. You know, Ronnie's mentioned that point in the, in the past. Uh, it's happening in Dublin with the, a Greyhound campaign. It's interesting, though, that um, one of the Camp Beagle videos um, had somebody who was a dog campaigner, a global dog campaigner. And, um, and so he was saying, and it was on an official video, well, you don't have to be vegan, you know, to support this campaign. And kind of playing down the vegan vegan angle to it, and so it does raise that difficult issue about who would be the spokesperson of this kind of campaign, because you, you're trying you're trying to bring the non-vegans in. At the same time, you don't necessarily want the non-vegans to be the spokespeople for for an, ab- an abolitionized campaign either. So I think that that is a potentially kind of difficult kind of uh, kind of issue. And then let me just put this back up. Um, Another aspect of it, Wendy, is the money, right, that has been spent. Yeah. Oh, so no, absolutely. I, I mean, and this, is, this would is... probably suggest this is a good in itself. The fact that um, it's it's, uh, but it's it's not the company though, is it? This is the taxpayers, right? Yeah. So this is um, someone applied for this information through Freedom of Information Act and. This is kind of up to date from, I think it was the 27th of June, I think it says on there, I can't read that tiny writing <laughs> on there, but I think it was from yeah, sometime in June till the 14th of September is 165,166 just to, just in relation to Camp Beagle. So whether that's, and it says um, action days, but I, I, I'm not, it doesn't break it down, but I don't know whether that's because the, the police are there basically 
on large protest days, there's sometimes a presence if there's quite a lot of activists, especially when the workers are coming in and out, because especially in the beginning there, there you know, was obviously um, interactions between the workers and the activists. And then on big protest days, the police have actually kind of formed a barrier between activists and, and the cars of the workers coming out, the wall of shame, as it's known. And... Um, and then also the the vans that come in to collect the the dogs have been having like police escort basically. And the first time it happened, there were two vans came in empty, but they there were about ten police vans. They'd about eighty to hundred police officers, and they'd shut off loads of roads so that more people couldn't come down to, to the protest and things like this. And all this is of course costing so much money to the taxpayer, so to to fund the these operations. So that's a point of contention as well. But of course, the public might see this the other way around. They might see it that the activists are forcing the police to do this and therefore they are creating this waste of taxpayers' money. So I guess it depends how which side of the line you sit on as to how you interpret that. Yeah, there's, a, there's also really some interest, interesting sociology here. Some work done by a guy called Richard Gale Normally, when social movement theorists look at social movements and their opponents, they talk about social movements and counter movements. What what Richard um, uh, Gale did was he, he looked at um, a, a triad. So he was talking about social movements, the counter movements, and the state or the state agencies. And he was basically saying that if um, if there's a lot of turbulence in society where 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 an issue becomes you know, uh, very public. There's a lot of people talking about it. There's a lot of money being spent on it and everything. What what will happen there is that the state eventually, or the state agency, will contact the animal user and say, "Look, you know, you're causing us a lot of trouble here. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have to sort yourself out." So, the state as well as the movement starts to put pressure on the animal industry. The problem with that, though another nuance is that usually what that means is is that what they do then is they they increase the welfare and say okay so we'll we'll, we'll kind of tidy this up and we'll tidy that up and so then the state then can go back to the public as it were and say we've put pressure on the industry that you're complaining about and and they're making the situation better so it it kind of it kind of works this kind of situation works where you can kind of get the state to kind of join in almost like with the movement a little bit it's just that usually that means improvements in welfare so again there's a kind of complication uh, there but it's kind of quite interesting from a, a strategic point of view if you like i think the other thing that can happen is of course the, the state can bring in more draconian laws to stop those things ever happening in the first place so that all those police don't have to be used and in fact that's you know that that's already happened in terms of the anti vivisection movement in the past where um where new laws were brought in to to, to prevent certain types of protest and they've done they you know they've done that before uh, and so that's the kind of, especially with the type of government we've got now i mean already they you know that they, they've got this legislation going through haven't they to, curb the right to protest um which they which they kind of claim has been stimulated by extinction rebellion for instance in their protest so that's mm. the other way that the state can can react by becoming more repressive this issue speaks to what you were saying before ronnie so this is uh, BOAV, cruelty free international um welcoming this uh, this move now <clears throat> it's interesting because if you say about um moves to bring about um you know legislation to abolish animal experiments right you you've got you've got a situation where um you're gonna have to do it on a global scale really because individual parliaments are not gonna be able to do it and and what um cruelty free international are, are saying here is that um the uk have got a fall in line with um with the european situation um, so, and you made the point about Brexit, I think, Ronnie, when you advertised uh, for this. So, so this would yeah. this would yeah. be kind of part and parcel of, of of another aspect to it, because you've got the the trouble, if you like, of the publicity being caused by some something like Camp Beagle, then being translated into this kind of um, initiative, um, which which is quite interesting. I'm just going to bring up another. And another take on this, which is a bit different from 
from that. Let me see if I can get it. So this is more of um, a scientist's uh, perspective on it. And it's not quite as good, uh, sadly, as, um, as some of the press about this issue uh, has gone in, in the... Um, uh, in the in the thing, so so I know that Peter have welcomed this, and there was um, there's something from um, Dublin that welcomed it, and um, an animal, whatever the BYV is called now, I can, I can never remember what, what they call it. Cruelty Free International, I think it's called. That's it. Yeah. So yeah. so this is talking really about the fact that really this this vote is really just a demand to kind of speed up the phase out, right? But it does say later on in this report, something very kind of worrying in a way. This is the bit that I've picked out here. And basically saying that there's already been an initiative going back to 2010, I think, where they're saying that as soon as there's a replacement, then they'll get rid of the animal test. And What's been suggested here is that this is just saying the same, that we're, we, we want to accelerate this process, but it's still going to rely on the fact that there's going to have to be a replacement for the animal test first, rather than, you know, like the other way around looking at it would be that um, if you abolish the animal experiments, then the replacements would come a, a lot quicker because there'd be a gap then, wouldn't they? You know, mm -hmm. nature of laws of vacuum and all that kind of stuff. Whereas this other way, around, say that. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's actually necessity as the mother of invention, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Like until yeah. until they stop funding animal research and and start funding some you know alternatives, that that's never going to happen, is it? It's, it is. They're just holding on to the old, but you haven't got the space to make way for the new in that way. You haven't got the yeah the capacity. And, and, so it's. And, 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 and things aren't used. You see, the problem is there's so much pressure. It's like you know the controversy over, for instance, like the, the the you know the COVID vaccine, for instance, the animals were used in the testing of it, and the animals are, um, are used. It's the horseshoe crabs, aren't they? And their blood is used to make sure that the the, the batches of the vaccine are, aren't contaminated. Now there are alternatives to both those things. Animals that you know that, that those those things can all be done. You know the 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 the, the vaccine can be tested. And that the vaccine could be um, certified free of contamination. Th they exist already. You know, the methods to do that exist already. It's just don't they don't use them because of tradition and maybe because of finance and and, and and other things. So it's not always the case that these things um, don't exist. It's the case that the will's not there to um, to use mm -hmm. them in animals. Yeah, yeah, and because in and in in this article as well, they talk a lot about financial uh, consequences and 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 status almost because they talk about the fear the fear is falling behind global competitors. So it's really kind of that profit and status that's driving that are driving forces behind this. And and actually, if they don't put in kind of dates and and deadlines for when this is going to happen. Then, like Roger was saying, nothing really changes from the original directive in 2010 because you're not really pushing it along until you have those dates and deadlines to to, to motivate the the changes. And and f even from 2017 to now, the number of the animal other animals being used has increased by two million. So it's it's going up continuously. So yeah, um, yeah it's was, really there shocking. Was there was something in where, where Gary Francione was, was a bit wrong, though. I, I mean, I don't know about the world, but I mean, we have 50, about over 50 million experiments every year worldwide. In, in the UK, it's about 3 million. It went down a bit because of COVID. And it's been around about 4 million, uh, you know, past few years. But what you got to remember, in the mid-70s, in, in the mid, in the mid -70s, it, was, it was over 6 million. The, 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 the biggest number of experiments in, in the UK was in, is, it was in the mid-70s. It's never been as high as that. And uh, I think the reduction was, I, I always think it's, it was a lot to do with ALF action and the, the kind of pressure that that exerted. It's never gone back to that again. So in, in, certainly in terms of the UK, Gary Francione was a, a bit wrong to say that ex animal experiments are, are more than they've ever been because that isn't, that isn't exactly the case here. So, so what's the what's the number in the in Britain? Because it was it was over five million, wasn't it, around the early seventies? Yeah, 
and then it went down to what two it, it, or something? It, it was over six mid seventies. Um, it was over six million, and then it went it went down to three million. You know, it, 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 ten years later, it was down to three million. Um, and the only thing really that had happened to to really affect it in those times, no legislation. There was, I think, there was some legislation in eighty six that might have reduced ex the experiment slightly. But in the meantime, there was nothing, and so the only the, the only thing that really happened was the ALF campaign against, uh, you know, against vivisection places that kind of, I, I think, along with the kind of <laughs> the terror <laughs> induced by the media, you know, putting fear into these people's you know minds that the ALF was some kind of terrorist organisation that it wasn't, but sort of played into our hands because it created the fear in. in, in in these people uh, and that's the only I, I can't see another reason why that went down it's never it's it's never gone back i mean it, it's, it went up from three million to kind of four million but it's never gone back to to over six million ever and, and are you saying because dave here is saying why is it rising you're saying it's not rising is that what you're saying no what i'm saying is is, is it's kind of it's has not the risen. highest it, it's risen mm -hmm. from from when it was three million it was it was went below three million and then it rose um to Four million, or perhaps slightly over four million, in the intervening years, but it never has been as high in the UK as it was in the mid seventies when it was over six million. Hmm. But that may um, have affected throughout the world. You know, throughout the world, it may have it, it may have been going up all the time. Uh, Deb, um, N Nella had to go for an appointment, so it was planned that um, that she disappeared. We sh we we sh we should have been a bit more polite and, and say goodbye to her, I think. But uh, well, she said she said she didn't say goodbye because she didn't want to interrupt the flow, so she just kind of uh, quietly slipped away. Otherwise, she would have said goodbye. <laughs> right. So do we do we move on to our our last subject because we've been wanting to cover this particular story for about a month now, I think, and we've never got round to it. So should we finish off with that, uh, Wendy? Uh, yeah, we could do. We could finish with with our little beautiful, sad, tragic, yes, story mm. of Geronimo. <laughs> yeah, so this is um, a really interesting story, obviously, because um, you know other animals are, are property, and you know, but then the state has got a say in there, you know, in terms of you know disease spreading and all this kind of stuff, foot and mouth, and in this case, TB and everything. So. This is the tragic story of Geronimo and an alpaca. So, a bit of a content warning on the next slide, which is the day that um, that Geronimo was taken by the police. So, w Wendy, you were you were part of the demonstration associated with this. Is that right? So I've I wasn't there. He I wasn't here, but I followed the story and done the petitions and the march and all of that stuff. Um, that was you know surrounding the the campaign to to help kind of uh, basically what's happened is that geronimo got brought over from new zealand and he tested negative um i think a few times in new zealand but then when he was brought to the uk um he he tested positive twice but his guardian says that there's no evidence that the relatively new test which is called something like Enfoplex, is accurate when used in alpacas and so um there was uh, i think a four-year ongoing battle to try to uh, get this this kind of ruling that geronimo need to be uh destroyed um i mean the language that is used is just abominable really um but it but there was a, then a high court ruling just uh, recently that even despite 140,000 signatures, a march to Downing Street and, and really global support, that they, the high court ruled that the genre had to be killed, murdered. And so, yeah, this is what happened just, just recently. It was really heartbreaking. Um, what's really interesting about this story for me, I think it, it shows the power of an individual story and how that can get, uh, public support and how people are really drawn in to the story of of, of one individual, mm, as opposed to Cecil. talking uh, talking about Cecil the lion. Yeah, yeah Cecil the lion and Geronimo. I think I think that really we ought to kind of really take note of that in in our advocacy, really, and how how we can really draw people in with stories and individuals rather than talking sometimes about mass numbers, which I think sometimes the human brain kind of shuts off and shuts down to. Um, 
but also despite of that again and, and it also highlights how despite huge support that defra got the go-ahead to to murder an individual and it just shows again the power of systems so defra is a governmental system protecting the interests of industries that exploit other animals for the food systems and and this is being you know normalized by social systems based upon speciesist values and attitudes so it, the systems are so powerful it almost feels sometimes like no matter what you do no matter how many people get behind it the systems just do what they're kind of conditioned and programmed to do <laughs> yeah the thing is that systems you see re really there isn't anything beyond the individual when people talk about systems talk about the state and all these things these aren't things that have kind of come down from the sky Th these are people Th these are all people behaving in a, in a certain way you know that they're kind of aren't separate to, to humans you see so, so in order to change systems you have to change humans and it's really back to the you know because we've got a government that's pro farmers i mean the reason why they've got their all this tb stuffs you know going around is is to do with animal farmers is to do with people that are, that are farming you know cows and and and, and other animals uh, and that kind of you know lose a load of money if those animals have got tb or you know supposedly have tb and, and this mm -hmm. is of course the, the kind of argument that's put forward in favor of the badger cull although i don't don't believe that's the real reason for the, the badger cull but it's the argument that's put forward and so basically it's because you've got a, you've got a government um that favors the farmers that favors animal farming and and so if we're going to ever change this we've got to replace them we've got to replace that with a totally different administration and the way we do that is through vegan education so you educate people to have a different mindset and they will vote in a different sort of politicians that will get rid of this the, the whole bloody show and and geronimo it's very sad about geronimo it's absolutely tragic and and you know you're absolutely right wendy that focusing on an individual animal like that can appeal to people in a way that big numbers don't the thing is that that oh, geronimo on, on the same day that geronimo was taken and slaughtered how many other animals were taken mm. to slaughterhouses and killed in, in, including a, a, a lot of animals killed because they had tb or supposedly had tb you know cows are being killed all the time because of this you know and they're being killed all the time obviously for human consumption as as with lots of other animals so, so it's kind of it, it's really a question of like using the story of geronimo as as mm -hmm. educate people to go vegan to say look it's just not geron it's not geronimo you know there's all these other animals that are just as beautiful and just as important as geronimo and have feelings just like geronimo and like don't you know don't don't be part of that those animals being taken to slaughter Mm. Oh, just to answer Paul, sorry, Paul, if I didn't mention that, tested positive for um, for TB, for bovine TB. It's in the um, second line anyway, there. Oh, okay, yeah. Just, um, just on that point about the individuals versus systems, this really interests me, actually, because, Ronnie, you're absolutely right. Systems are definitely made up of individuals, and yet I feel that individuals are also really heavily influenced by systems and we're almost inherit systems and we're socialized into systems and you can you can see that individuals are very heavily um influenced by environment of what's considered normal and acceptable and the systems that we have in place have big influence over that such as schools and education uh, facilities, government, media, the scientific community, even religions—all these, all these kind of systems that are that are in place. So I feel sometimes, although these systems are made up of individuals, individuals do get kind of almost manipulated into them, and, and culturally, even 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 if, for example, you start a job, you can almost tell the culture of that of that place quite quickly, um, and soon individuals get kind of subsumed into that culture, and you you become part of it and it's very then hard to change that system because you kind of get sucked into the processes and the procedures and the bureaucracy of it and so i although i do definitely agree that, that systems are made of individuals i don't see it. it's not always that easy to just change everything by changing individual i think it's almost we have to try and do both again like work on both individuals and, and systemic change i don't know I'd, I'd be really interested in what roger says um, as a sociologist about about this whole individual versus system well that well that was the issue. first issue we, we dealt with with in in the, in the francion um uh debate or whatever you want to call it the other day in, in the sense that we, we were talking about xr and stuff you know and so there, there is that thing about um 
you know, it's, we're talking about we're talking about culture, and so systems have a, a lot of say in in the culture which ends up inside individuals. At the same time, individuals make up the structure. So it, it's that sociological dualism that's always been been there in the sense that I, I think I said that um, it does bring up that um, quintessential sociological idea that we're free and unfree at the same time. And so we are kind of trapped in a system and yet we we are we can move around not as free agents but as agents within the system. So yeah, you you've got pulls and pushes both ways uh, in that sense. So it's you know it's difficult to say which one which one first. In, in a sense, mm -hmm. but um, certainly in terms of um, trying to alter a system within a species society is going to be very difficult. I mean, that's where animal rebellion have, have got their work cut out because you're dealing with a species structure filled up with species. You know, it's like Ronnie's point at the beginning, you know, that um, if, you, if you've got species MPs and legislators, how are you going to get anywhere if you've got if you've got species police force just like with them um, i mean the sabs have been saying that they don't expect the police to really properly investigate the last attack on mel because they're biased so if all that is against you the structure is against you then the idea of being able to influence the structure in some way is is a bit fanciful the, the only way you can do it is if the structure feels under threat by the views of the individuals who ultimately, you know, control it. If, if that's even a thing as well, you know, it's, it's complicated. Mm. I, th I think XR mm. is pro pro probably, you know, you know, the most important thing XR are, are, are maybe doing is educational, same with animal rebellion, you know, where, where they can really force this government to really make any kind of radical change because, because basically you're asking the, uh, the government to change its fundamental ideology. If you're really going to do something about, you know, the the, the climate catastrophe and 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 you know, the destruction of the natural world, you, they're going to have to change their fundamental ideology, and they're not going to do that. You see, and that's difficult. But I think all the publicity that's risen out of things, you know, can educate people towards changing as individuals. And if people change as individuals, see the world in a different way, then they may, you know voting politicians that are going to actually you know have some effect in changing the system and you know you, you know putting these measures that we desperately need in place it, it's it's a do, it's a do with um speed though i mean people think you know i mean like one one early critique of vegan education was oh you're trying to change the world one plate at a time there was those kind of phrases at the same time as we've even seen from that uh, proposed speeding up of the phase out if you're trying to change things on a structural level, that takes a hell of a long time as well, because you know there are there are structural barriers to to what you want you want to achieve, and that's always been one of the problems with um, single issues in the sense that each each one, you know, it takes 30, 40 years to say, you know, I mean, what what was it? I mean, it was even longer than that to get the the hunting ban right. Uh, and, and then the hunting ban wasn't very good because it was it was trying to be framed and organized within a species of society. So so the hunting ban in Britain is is pretty crap because it's full of loopholes. The police won't enforce it. And then you've always got pressure in Parliament to reverse it anyway, which is what Johnson said at, at one point, didn't he? And then went back on that. And so, you know, these are, these are difficult things. The surest way from a vegan point of view uh, is to increase the number of ethical vegans in society, but that is a very, very slow process. Mm. But it, but you see, it's better to have a slow process that works than to do something that doesn't work. If that's that's the only choice in in front of us. There is no, I don't think there is no any quick route. There's no fast route, and I think it's a shame that maybe that vegan education didn't start a long, long time ago. In, in you know. Because it's only a very recent phenomenon. It's, it's really mm. going on 20, 25 years. If we'd started that, you know, further back, would be be further ahead now. And if people, instead of protesting, had, you know, been involved in education, would we be further along the road now towards animal liberation? I think maybe we don't know, but I think maybe we would. Or, or maybe just if if those single issues in those days would have been abolitionized, so they they would have included that vegan message that, that you yeah. wanted, rather than because it was true that 
the single issues in back in the day really kept in their in their lane, as the saying goes, wasn't it? And so, you know, to the extent that I mean, Francione used to get criticised because he was always the lawyer for, for for these campaigns in the states, and so sometimes journalists would interview him, and they would say, "Ah, yeah, but you're you're a, on a fur thing, but really, you want to end this consumption of meat, don't you?" And he would say, "Yes." But then the campaigners would tell him off for saying that because they want <laughs> you see that so that that's where the tension tension is there. Mm. <clears throat> a couple mm. of issues from um, what we've got on the screen. First of all, because Bernie Wright was telling me Bernie Wright it runs um, a far in in Ireland for people who don't know uh, Alliance for Armor Rights. She was saying that apparently they're experimenting in sending live pigs from Ireland to. China at the moment, and we're not quite sure about the method. We think possibly on on a, on a plane on planes because a sea journey would take too long. With we're thinking we're not quite sure, but this thing, the first line about brought over from New Zealand to England, and that's a hell of a journey. Mm. I mean, was was that on a was that on a plane or what, I mean, it couldn't have been on a boat. Surely that would have taken months and months, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, do get, you do get animals transported. Long, I mean, a lot of animals go from um, Australia to the Middle East, for instance, and these huge uh, transporter ships. And also, um, you, you know, when when that uh, there was a blockage of the Suez Canal, um, th there were animals on on um, ships that were held up, and they were they were once again animals going to the you know. Uh, I, I think to the Middle East, and, and they were going from, uh, I think, from places, countries like Romania and Portugal. So they were really going on on really quite long sea journeys. So it does happen. And the, the thoroughbred horses, they go by by plane, don't they? Because they've got to get to their you know their their new racing place quick, right? You know, so you you know you got you got you've got these horse horse races all over the world. I think they're always transported by these cargo uh, planes, which presumably have got stalls set up inside them. So perhaps it was one of those. Yeah. The second thing I wanted to talk about in relation to this is I, I got this feeling, Ronnie, that if Geronimo had happened when the ALF was going strong in, in the 80s, that Geronimo would have been disappeared. Before. Yes, I think this was. I wondered why he, he wasn't spirited away in the night, and you know, other people have wondered. Yes, he would have been disappeared. Something would have happened. He would have been. He would have been taken. Um, but that kind of doesn't seem to be so much the mindset of people um, these days. And it, it, kind of in practical terms, maybe more difficult to do that. There's more surveillance. You know, a lot of the roads have surveillance on them and everything. It's harder to get away with stuff. But I think, you know certainly had the same mindset existed amongst activists today as it did then yeah i'm, I'm sure that he, he, he would have been, he would have been taken yes definitely well, when wendy pointed out that he is a quite a distinctive individual um <laughs> and, and also i think wendy you thought that maybe there was a bit of faith in the in the kind of appeal system that that he might have been maybe and i think i think it was such a high profile profile case as well that might have made it even more difficult because it was so high profile and and also maybe maybe it had been suggested and maybe refused and maybe the guardian wanted to go through that procedure because she felt that she wanted to push for you know for legal victory in a way so yeah, i don't know you i don't you know the way the way it would have happened right is that is that is that a, a group would have pro approach the guardian and say look we can disappear Geronimo and and if and if she'd have said no they might have disappeared him anyway which would have which mm. would have made her kind of shock about about him gone be very real then because she didn't actually want it but I mean it would have kind of I think somebody would have mm. tried it in those days at least but I, I think, think your thing about surveillance is is right Ronnie mm. yeah yeah, yeah but it's the, a lot harder now, isn't, isn't, it? isn't there a question mark over the over the the, the the woman that had Geronimo, wasn't she? Didn't she have? Did she have other alpacas that were were farmed? Or, or was it just? I think Geronimo? she. I think no. I think she has others. I think so she has others there. I don't. Know if, I don't know if she's breeding them or not. I'm not sure. But I think he had to be separated from from the others. So, so they, 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 and do they have a, a different status to 
Geronimo, does she is she not so bothered about those ones going for slaughter as she was about him? No, presumably the difference of status is is that they were negative and Geronimo was positive. Mm. Is that is that the is that kind of the only difference then? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think I think it was just that, that test and he. Been... I just knew, heard that she had others, and I wondered about what their you know kind of what yeah. their situation was. But like the whole thing wouldn't have arisen if 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 alpacas hadn't been exploited in the first place, would it? I mean, what the hell are they doing in Australia? What the hell are they doing in this country? That they're, they're, they're from. You know, they're from South America, aren't they? You know, what, what, why, are they, why are they over here? Why are they in other countries? What's going on? That's only because they've been... Yeah, I know. A lot of people are, are breeding them now and, and yeah. Um, yeah. keeping them as, as so-called pets, aren't they? I, I remember, I, I don't know if I was... I think it was... I was telling you this the other day that um, I remember going on a, on a dog walk with uh, Seamus, who sadly is no longer with me, but um, a few years ago, and just walking through the woods, just minding your own business, and all of a sudden to a couple with a huge alpaca just <laughs> came up in front of us and we were like whoa and Seamus was like whoa <laughs> who yeah. is that and and he really wanted to to go and check her out but we had to really hold him back but yeah, was like, yeah. Oh, okay who's this now oh yeah we'll just start walking the alpaca yeah. like, okay but, <laughs> of course it's the same yeah. with sheep. if you're talking about animals that kind of shouldn't be here the same with sheep sheep, sheep are from the near east they're from you know rocky mountainside terrains where it's dry underfoot and this is why so many of them suffer from foot rot and, and, and other diseases and so many of them die in the fields when it's wet because that's not conditions all right it's that we've had sheep you know quite a few hundred years but that's only a tiny tiny blip in, in in sort of evolutionary terms and they're not acclimatized mm -hmm. to, to living over here and this is why there's such a high mortality rate uh, or one of the reasons why there's such a high mortality rate amongst um before they're even sent to slaughter, you know, they die in, they die in the fields. I remember one uh, uh, being on holiday in Wales once and uh, there was a, a tremendous um, storm in the night um, with loads of rain. We went, we went out the next day, drove somewhere and looking in the fields, there was all sheep lying dead in the fields. Loads, you know, because they couldn't cope with that, you know, with, with, with that, those conditions. And this is nothing people don't realise. They think, oh, it's really natural. Oh, look at the sheep in the fields. This is like, you know, this is yeah. really typical of England. No, it's not. They shouldn't be here. They're not. They're not from here. They're not climatised to be here. And it's the same yeah. with loads of animals, really. And John, I'm really sorry. Joe jo said a little bit earlier. It's also bloody depressing. John, I'm really sorry. I hope we haven't depressed you because we. I know we've all got hope. Actually, I was with Joe. Joe was the person who first yeah. showed me the picture of of John and I being yeah. taken to be um, murdered that day. We but so we don't, yeah, we don't we mean to, to, to carry on either. fighting, you know, let that let that inspire people. Yeah. Fight for all, all right, Geronimo's, you know, gone. Nothing we can do to save Geronimo, but, you know, we can do something to prevent, Going. you know, millions, billions of other animals being slaughtered, you know, by campaigning for veganism so that one day, you know, these animals aren't. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because, I mean, Deb is saying, well, you know, they, they, they can be used as pack and trail um, animals as as well, and, th and that that really does strengthen the case for vegan education because you're kind of having to go at everything at once, rather than this idea that you're taking thirty and forty years to bring down. You know, I mean, like there's there's been a heck of a long campaign against uh, other animals in circuses, and we're just about at the stage now where, uh, I mean, this kind of shows the kind of problem really because I think a lot of so-called wild animals are now banned in lots and lots of uh, places but they're re they're replacing them with so-called domesticated other animals including ironically i think alpacas might be one of the animals that have, are in, been introduced into circuses now you know along with an increase in in dogs and ponies and, e and even in even cats and, e and even ducks i mean i used to know this guy who worked in, in um a circus in uh, on the other white and um they used to have dancing ducks, but they, 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 they actually put them on a hot plate. The, the audience didn't know mm. that, that it was a hot plate that they were put on. And so, of course, they were looking as though they were dancing, but they were, they were, their feet were being burnt, you know, so. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. So, you think know, you've like, heard it um, all. <laughs> yeah. But, like, I think the thing is it's important for people to, yeah, it's depressing, but it's important not to dwell on that. You know, what we've got to think about is what can we do about this? You know, how can we move forward to end this? You know, and, and that that kind of that really involves a positive mindset. You know, we've got to go out there positively and, and you know, educate, educate, educate. 
you know, that, mm. and, and kind of, you know, the anger that we feel, you know, the my main emotion at any of these things is anger, is anger against, you know, the species mm. and the oppressors. Uh, and that, you know, we need to use that anger as a fuel to drive us on so that we, we you know, we, we're kind of determined, we're relentless, you know, in, and I'd say to it, you know, any, anyone listening, you know, get out there and, you know, organize stuff, you know, get, get stuff going in your local area to, to spread the vegan message. Because that's, that's, that's really important without people instigating stuff, you know, without people organizing mm. stuff, it's not going to happen. So, and, and we can all do it. You know, or virtually all of us, you know, that that are, that are fit and healthy and everything, you know, or, or to, you know, <laughs> I suppose I'm still fairly fit and healthy, <laughs> but yeah, we can, you know, we, you know, nearly all of us are capable of, of kind of doing that, and, and that that's the that's the way to react to to, to all this depressing mm -hmm. news. I, I think that's I think that's... that's what was asked, wasn't it, for a, a ban on all of all of them? It's just that it didn't work out that way, as far as, as I know. It's the same way as um. It was asked for a ban on battery cages, and um, combustion wall farming didn't know that they would come up with the idea of enriched <coughs> battery cages. So mm. the industry are always trying to, you know, th this this is the problem, you know, try, trying to get change through legislation in a deeply speciesist situation is really difficult because you never get what you want. You partially get what yeah. you want, and it's usually, you know, and then so. The same groups that have campaigned for years and years to, to get certain legislation, 10 years later, they're exposing it as being no good. The same the same groups in the same way as um, we've now got groups um, saying that having cameras in slaughterhouses is no good. And yet there was a big long campaign to get them. Yeah. In slaughterhouses. The, the, the other thing is, is, is to do with sources and energy. You know, a lot of resources and energy are put into these kind of welfareist campaigns, aren't they, to kind of you know, try and bring in half measures or slight improvements. Uh, it would be far better to, to put all that energy into vegan education. That that would, achieve, I, I, I think, you know, apart from anything else, it's a tremendous sort of waste and misplacement of, of resources and energy to campaign for... for but well, you wouldn't say that about Camp Beagle, though, would you? I mean, there's a lot of money being spent now on that, right? Well, well, the thing is, um, it's, it, 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 it's kind of a difficult one because I can see how, I can see how, uh, if you're saying to people, if you're saying to people like, um, you know, we want, we, you know, we, we want hens in, in bigger cages, then you're kind of put, you're sort of putting a top limit on kind of what you want. And, you know, if Camp Beagle are saying, yeah, we want the beagles freed, but we want all animals freed from experiments. And kind of, I think they should also be saying, and we want veganism, or certainly if they go and do stalls and stuff for camp beagle then that maybe is that maybe is slightly different but i think the bottom line is like i can't you know whatever you think of camp beagle camp beagle exists people are going to continue going there because they're drawn to that sort of thing Pe people are always drawn when there's big numbers at a thing it attracts other people you know but I, and it's weird because i've never been like that <laughs> i was like I, you know i kind of tend to shy away from big things like you know the alf was about small groups of people sneaking around in the night and that's probably what attracted me to it you know uh, <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> it's all going yeah. out now running <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I kind of like doing i, I tend to do things with kind of small groups i tend to think it's more kind of efficient in the way depending on what you're doing you know and like outreach you need a lot of people you know um and so on that doesn't really appeal to me in fact it's i find it a little bit off putting when there's like a big crowds of people but most people aren't like that they like it they're kind of attracted to you know, maybe because because we're kind of herd animals, maybe like people are attracted to that, and, and whether they like it or not, can't be this. This has become a phenomenon. It's got its own momentum, and and so rather than kind of argue against it, just to say, well, look, how can this be taken forward? How can this be improved? How can this be used to further you know, vegan education? And I think that's the best, of, you know, that's the best of approach to it, really. Well, I guess the same attitude could be um, applied to all the other welfare groups or all the other welfare campaigns or all the welfare. I'm not calling Camp Beagle welfare campaign, you, but um, you'd have to, well, I, I, I think that, yeah, I, I mean, whether a group like Compassion and World Farming would ever have something in their campaign to say go vegan, I don't know. But that's, and whether that mm. would fit in with what they're saying, I'm you know i i don't know i, no, I mean you can I mean, I so. years ago when we ran a um louise and i ran a campaign 
for many years against the dog racing industry on our website we always had the first thing people came to on our website was was quite a big section about go vegan you should go vegan it's not just greyhounds that are oppressed and exploited it's it's kind of all animals and you should go vegan and so we, incorpor we, we incorporated that kind of into you know what was you know could be arguably a single issue campaign although it was an abolitionist campaign it, it was still single issue we um we did have you know we were trying to get people to go vegan as well at the same time so that sometimes with some campaigns that is possible Mm, that's the trick, isn't it? To abolitionise yeah. the message. Yeah. Make it make Let's it clear. Abolitionise the world, folks. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's yeah. probably it's probably time to go. There is an interesting question about the sentience bill, but uh, maybe we can come back to that another time. Mm. We're well over. I don't know anything about that. It's a British thing, apparently, a British Parliament thing. So um, yeah, I'm surprised Brian is not on my case because he usually is by now. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's over time. Brian's time too. So, so yeah. <laughs> No, but just still, to reiterate, go on, Wendy. Sorry. Oh no, I was just going to reiterate what what Ronnie said to um, because I said that in the beginning of my speech at the Animal Rights March. Actually, is just to to channel the the emotion that you feel, channel your anger, channel your sorrow into taking action. Definitely, and and I feel that as activists, this, I often feel like this. It's like we straddle two worlds every minute of every day, the despair and hope continuously, and you just have to sort of keep that hope alive burning burning every day and just yeah go out yeah. there and take it's action for, it's better for us as well it, 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 as well as being obviously you know good for, good for the other animals we're trying to, to to liberate for ourselves as well you know rather than to letting that overwhelm us you know and, and eat away at us if if we kind of if, if we focus on on turning that into into positive energy where we can go out and campaign that's actually good for our own mental health as well Oh, it's essential. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, totally agree. But whether whether my mental health is all right is a is a question of opinion, I suppose. <laughs> I, I haven't got any left, so <laughs> that's the whole great. kind of worms to liberate. I, 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 spent, I, spent too, <laughs> I spent too long in a song with Roger to be saying these days. There we are. <laughs> yeah, it's all Roger's fault. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure you're going to get that uh, that that um, oh, day because um, he's. Uh, I, I think I think he's sat, sat by his food bowl at this st stage now. Isn't <laughs> yeah, he? You usually go in <laughs> like that. Anyway, Brian, where are you, Brian? Oh, he's here. Come on, Dave wants to see you. Come on, you come in. <laughs> he's coming, Dave. Hello, are you hungry? <laughs> Here he Brian, is, Dave. Come on, we'll close the show for us, Brian. We can show them. Brian, do you want to close the show? Yeah. Well, his, bot his bottom does. That's how he wants yeah. to close it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the pencil sharpener will close the uh, the show. So um, <laughs> we, we want to th want to thank those uh, poor souls who have lasted with us. We've got, still got twelve online. So thanks very much, everyone. We're, we're way over time. So sorry about that. It's Ronnie's fault, obviously. And so because um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we never want we never want to argue when Ronnie's not here. <laughs> and Ronnie, so, you're back with us next week, I believe. Yes. So, uh, yeah. But, oh, don't say that because no one will tune in. Yeah, next week we're in. <laughs> yeah, you've sabotaged our next week's show now, Wendy. What is? I, oh. forgot what, I forgot what the show's about. Oh, it's about the environment <laughs> thing, isn't it? It's about the climate crisis, isn't it? going to be. It is. Part yeah. three. Part with, three. With Panama, part three, um, which hopefully will be the final part. Hi, yeah, yeah. and we were we were going to um, we were going to do a story today, but we've we decided to hold it over. I can't remember where it was. Oh, that's is it? CO two one was it or? Um, in the guillemots for next week. Oh, the guillemots, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. almost yeah. died off the the, the that's north right, coast, yeah. doesn't it? Because of the, guillemots, um, yeah. um, the climate crisis. But that's reflected all the world around, whether whether it's the, the heating of the seas or whether it's the fires. You know, all these you know billions of the free living beings are, are you know are, are, are dying because of it, and it's horrendous. It's caused by human activity and. For which our species is responsible, and it's just right, right, people. Before well, Ronnie goes on to on to, on to <laughs> speak, what's so, vegan, vegan good, good, goodbye from the four of us <laughs> myself, Ronnie, uh, Brian, and Wendy. And so, goodbye, good night, and see you next week. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
coming, Bri. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs>